By the end of this video, you'll be able to kimchi whatever your mind, body, and soul yearns for. To summarize, making kimchi is a preservation technique. The technique that we're going to go over in this video is one that can be applied to dozens of different vegetables with similar results. I actually think it's smarter to think about kimchi as a verb rather than a single dish. Because if you really think about it, you can kind of kimchi anything, vegetable-wise. Don't go kimchiing a houseplant or the family cat. Be reasonable. So the most popular cabbage, the one that most people are probably most aware of, is actually made from Napa, also called Chinese cabbage. But as I mentioned earlier, there are literally hundreds of different kimchis, maybe even thousands. And luckily, Korean people have been making kimchi for hundreds of years, so, you know, most of the groundwork is pretty much laid out for us. Thank you, Korea. The formula for most kimchi is to remove water from the vegetable using salt, rubbing it down with a flavorful paste, then letting it all kind of marry together and ferment. Today, we're going to make kimchi with a few vegetables. This is Napa or Chinese cabbage. Making kimchi with this gorgeous green hunk is probably the most classic type of kimchi you can find. Start by removing a bit of the tail if need be, then use a sharp knife to slice halfway up the cabbage from the root end. Make two slices like so, then use those slices to pull the cabbage apart like so. One time down the middle, then again to make four wedges of cabbage. So as I mentioned earlier, this specific technique can be used to kimchi a bunch of different vegetables. On top of the Napa cabbage today, I'm going to kimchi some cucumber spears and radish. Cucumbers are basically all water, so I'm just removing some of the watery seeds as shown here. This is a Korean radish. You can find these at any local Korean market, but I've also seen them pop up in other Asian grocery stores too. If you can't get your hands on one of these girthy bullets, go ahead and substitute for daikon radish, which you can find pretty much everywhere nowadays. I like my radish kimchi in large, rustic chunks. Like cucumber, radish is high in water content, so these cubes are definitely going to shrink down a bit, so don't worry. Okay, step one complete. Our veggies are cut up and ready to be salted. Before we salt our Napa cabbage, we're going to rinse it in cold water. The water helps the salt stick to the leaves of the cabbage, so no need to do this for the cucumber or the radish. Like I said, they have high water content, so this step would be sort of redundant. Once the cabbage is rinsed, it's time to salt. Heavily. And I mean heavily. Salt the living poops out of the cabbage on this step. Take your time, pull up the individual leaves, and make sure to hit all the cracks and crevices. Don't worry, all this salt will be washed away, so be generous. We salt the vegetables in this process to remove water to break down its cells. The breaking down of the cells makes the vegetables' nutrients more available for the good bacteria to feed on, which are more salt tolerant than other bad bacteria. Once seasoned to heck, set the veggies aside. Now we're going to let the salted vegetables sit at room temperature for two hours. Every 30 minutes, flip the vegetables. Salty water will begin to show up at the bottom of the tray, and I like to lightly sort of press the vegetables into this brine to help it soak in sort of like a sponge. You could also use a spoon or a small ladle to base the brining water over the vegetables. You know, do whatever works for you. As the veggies chill in that salt, we're going to begin by making our kimchi paste. To kick it off, we're going to make a porridge of starch, sweetener, and water. For the sweetener, I really dig brown sugar. I know it sounds odd, but the molasses in the brown sugar adds a little bit more complexity to the kimchi. This little guy, he's adorable. For the starch, I like gluttonous rice flour. Uh, you can buy this at most Asian markets again, but you can also substitute this for all-purpose flour if that's what you have around. Add everything to the saucepan, bring it to a boil, then reduce the heat to a simmer and let it run for three to four minutes. After that, take it off the heat and let it cool to room temperature. As the porridge component cools, we're going to make the flavor component for the paste. All right, it'll never be not spooky carrying an open container of fish sauce like that. This next part is simple. We're just going to take all these ingredients and puree them in a blender. But there are a couple specialty ingredients that I'd like to touch on. These are Korean fermented salted shrimp. In my opinion, kimchi just isn't the same without it. Buy it once at an Asian market and it'll keep in your fridge for half a year. If you don't have access to it, just add a little more fish sauce to the mixture, no biggie. Speaking of which, this is the fish sauce that I use. Fish sauce is just that. It's a sauce made from fermented anchovies. Into the blender goes one white onion, half a peeled apple, a cup couple knobs of ginger and a buttload of garlic. Then the fermented shrimp and the fish sauce. The last two ingredients are going to help season the kimchi paste and give it a blast of umami. Cover it up and blitz everything until smooth. If you don't have a high-powered blender, it really helps to chop up the onion, apple, and ginger into small pieces before you add them. Okay, so the kimchi paste is almost ready. We just need to add our cooled porridge in with that flavorful mixture that we just made and add one last important ingredient. This is gochugaru powder. Gochugaru is a Korean chili pepper that comes in both mild and spicy varieties. It adds a certain flavor and gives the kimchi its signature deep red coloring. It comes in whole pepper form, flakes, and this powder. I just find that the powder incorporates best with the kimchi paste. Mix everything together until it forms into a thick, bright red paste. Get a load of that beautiful red goo. Oh.
Okay, now let's cut up some secondary veggies for our kimchi. At this point, you can add extra flavors from herbs or other vegetables to supplement the main vegetable kimchi. I like keeping things straightforward with some carrot, radish, and scallions. I'm just squaring off that Korean radish that we talked about earlier to make thin strips. Uh, it would be sort of redundant to add more radish to our radish kimchi, so these are just gonna be for my cabbage and cucumbers. And don't worry, there's really no need to salt these vegetables here like we did our main kimchi vegetables. After the two hours is up, it's time to rinse and clean off the main vegetables. Now I want to show you something called the snap test. To determine if your cabbage is ready or not, tear a leaf off and bend it. If the leaf bends back without cracking or breaking, then the kimchi is ready for the next step. If it breaks, just let it sit a little longer in the salty water. When the cabbage is primo, we need to clean it thoroughly. It's best to use a large bowl or block off your entire sink to do this. If you did things the right way, there's going to be a ton of salt on this cabbage and we need to make sure that it comes off. This is also our chance to clean off any particles or dirt that may be stuck on the cabbage itself. After the cabbage and other vegetables have been rinsed and cleaned, let them drain in a colander for 10 to 15 minutes. We want the vegetables to dry before we give them a massage they'll never forget. Once drained, the cabbage is pretty much ready to rock. Uh, some people like to leave the cabbage quarters whole like this before fermentation, but I like to cut them into manageable pieces. Do so by slicing the root end away from the rest of the leaves. The leaves will begin to come apart after you do this, so from here you can slice and dice the cabbage into whatever size you like. I prefer my kimchi in pieces like this, somewhere between one to three inch squares. Once sliced, drape over any of those additional vegetables that we cut up earlier. Then it's massage time. Slather on some of that luscious kimchi paste and use your hands to mix it into the cabbage. If you don't want your hands to get red for the next couple hours, I recommend wearing gloves, but if you're a soldier, I say just go for it. I like to think of myself as a lover, not a fighter, so uh, it's gloves for this guy. Take your time to rub the paste into each of the vegetables. Portion out the kimchi paste as you see fit. I use about half of the kimchi paste on the cabbage and the other two quarters on the cucumber and the radish. Yeah, so cucumber is an interesting choice for kimchi. It's one of my personal favorites and many people actually like to eat it fresh, meaning that it's, it's not fermented but instead eaten right away. I like it both ways. In this case, I'm going to get these boas nice and ready for fermentation and just eat them later, but it's your call. Now it's time to pack and store away the kimchi for fermentation. Traditionally, kimchi was fermented in clay pots, like some bigger than toddlers and others small and super compact. I like to let my kimchi ferment in glass jars because they don't stain and it's super easy to see all the bubbly activity that's going on inside. Stuff the kimchi into jars, leaving some room at the top. Make sure to press down throughout the entire process. We want little to no air in the jar and pressing the kimchi down helps move it out. We also want to make sure that the kimchi juice or brine is covering the vegetables completely. Once packed in, cover the jar loosely with a lid or a cheesecloth. We, we just need to make sure that the kimchi can breathe or else it could explode. No tight lids. Trust me, nobody needs a kimchi grenade on their hands. The stuff is next to impossible to get off the wall, so channel your inner Jackson Pollock elsewhere with paint and uh, not kimchi juice. Once the kimchi is packed in, let it ferment at room temperature for two to three days. The warmer the room, the quicker the fermentation process will take. So it's summer here in Chicago. The fermentation is going to move a little quicker than it would in the winter. Some people weigh the kimchi down with weight so it doesn't overflow out the top as it ferments, but I don't bother. Just just make sure to store the fermenting kimchi on a tray or something that'll catch the drippings. This is one day left out. As you can see, the wild bacteria have already started their work inside the kimchi. By the third day, this kimchi is about ready to head into the fridge. It never completely halts, but chilling the kimchi down in the fridge dramatically reduces the fermentation process. Okay, so let's take a gander at the Napa cabbage kimchi first. Uh, things are looking quite spectacular. A bunch of bubbles, the smell is ripe and healthy. Everything is going great here in this jar. Oh, and if you ever hear the term kimchi brine, that's what this stuff is. Uh, kimchi brine is made when the water from the vegetables releases into the kimchi paste to create this like salty, tangy, scarlet liquid. You might see a recipe ask for kimchi brine in its ingredient list, so uh, there you go. Alright, time for a taste test. A little radish kimchi, a little cuke kimchi, or cuke as nobody calls it. Here are the cukes. Uh, I cut these into spears, but they're also pretty good cut into thicker rounds, kind of like that. Again, the Napa kimchi is looking fine as heck on day three. That crunch don't lie, and of course the radish is looking pretty killer too. Mm. 
So it wasn't always this way, but kimchi has gotten a lot of love in the past decade or two. And for good reason, I mean it's spicy, tangy, rich in umami, and an excellent accompaniment to a lot of different things. And it's pretty cool because the same batch of kimchi actually tastes different throughout the stages of its life. Yes, kimchi has a life cycle. I mean, after all, we're talking about live cultures here. It starts off fresh and slowly but surely gets a little more tangy, tangy, twangy, tangy, and then eventually pretty sour, but it's still good in its own way. Usually people throw it in a pancake or make soup with it at that point. Making kimchi is a very old, very involved activity heavily ingrained in Korean culture. I mean, there are some people that set aside entire days and get the whole family involved in the kimchi making process. Speaking of culture, I actually grew up in a household heavily influenced by Korean culture as well. Uh, my stepmom and stepgrandma are both Korean. So I grew up eating a lot of Korean food. Kimchi was omnipresent. I've been facing the stuff since I was a wee lad and doing the research and development for this video was a blast. And now I have 13 and a half pounds of kimchi in my fridge, but uh... I can handle it. I can handle it. A lot of kimchi pancakes in this guy's future. And if you're still here, thank you so much for wasting your time with me, and I will see you next week.